Okay, welcome back. It's been a long break. Um, sorry for the two cancellations. I had no options. Uh, there's no point coming here with a uh, little bit, a few pages. Um, so since there's been a break, we'll just take a quick look at what we did last time, and then uh, move on. We've been looking at uh, coastal adjustment, but on a beta plane, after we finished the FPLM solutions. And uh, we looked at the tau y case. We first started with uh, full geostrophy, that is setting ut and bt to zero, no friction. And uh, we found that uh, we proceeded in exactly the same way as done earlier. We had uh, an interior solution that was a particular solution, and a coastal solution that's homogeneous equations. And uh, though there was no wind curve, we found that uh, we get a Rossby wave. <coughs> In this case, there was no Kellen wave front because we had assumed full geostrophy. So the Kellen wave was filtered out because we set Vt to zero. The Kelvin wave propagated at infinite speed along the coast. But this kind of approximation is not uncommon. And it's a very sensible approximation to make if the process of interest is Rossby wave. Because the Kelvin wave time scale is much smaller, much shorter than the Rossby wave time scale. So if what you're interested in is the Rossby wave, you can filter out the Kelvin wave. But if you're looking at what happens along the boundary and its impact on the interior, then you probably have to look at the Kelvin wave. So that is the way you go about making these approximations. <clears throat> so in this case, we were looking at the solution at a time after the coastal adjustment due to the Kelvin waves had taken place. So that is instantaneous in this case, and we look at what happens after that. We got uh, the following solution. Ahead of a Rossby wave front, which was basically a delta function like uh, solution, we had only the Ekman drift. That was the interior solution. So you have a meridional wind and it drives an Ekman drift, a zonal Ekman drift. Then you have this Rossby wave front behind which <coughs> there is no current. It's a steady balance in which the um, Pressure gradient balances of instruments. This is basically a sweat root balance. Ahead of the front, there's the Ekman drift. So as the Rossby wave propagates westward, this delta function like current, which is actually at the coast at uh, t equals zero plus, moves westward. And uh, behind uh, the front propagates faster as one moves towards the equator, leading to the tilt shown in this figure. And this is very typical of a Rossby wave. So the Rossby wave as it propagates westward, annihilates the Ekman drift in the interior and leaves behind a sweat root balance. By interior here is meant what is there behind the Rossby wave front, between the front and the post. So the Ekman drift that is part of the interior solution is destroyed by the Rossby wave as it goes uh, westward. Because it has a U field associated with it and that cancels out the Ekman drift. We said that uh, if you look at data, you will find that you don't really have a delta function for the front. And uh, if you look at data for the wind, you also find that you normally don't have switched on winds. There's usually a finite uh, time, even if short, over which the wind field uh, sets up. So if you replace theta of t by a smoother function t of t, as shown here, then the delta function will be replaced by dou t by dou t. And that is uh, not uh, squashed like a delta function. It has a finite width. So in practice, V is not a delta function, but is a broader field. It, uh, reasons for this front having a finite width include uh, theta of t being replaced by a smoother function t of t. 
the finite adjustment time the Kelvin which we didn't have in this case. So V T won't be zero, C won't be infinity, and friction. So then we said let's look at what happens when we include friction, vertical mixing, in the mass conservation equation. And then uh, this is where we stopped uh, last time. We looked at this solution. We'll just go over that quickly. Then uh, we said we'll include friction in the long shot on the measurable momentum equation in this case, and also retain V T. So that's the solution we'll look at today. We continue to assume full geostrophy, so no VT, and uh, the only change we make now is to add this uh, vertical mixing term, kappa p by c squared. Everything proceeds as earlier. And if you look at the transform variable, this part, this part, and this part, these terms are identical to what we had earlier. The new part is this one, exponential uh, kappa alpha squared by beta into x. So if kappa is zero, then this term will disappear. It will just be replaced by one. Likewise here, when you look at u hat, the transformed uh, u field, you will get this as the new term, the same exponential uh, term. Um, now this is going to give us uh, a different solution mode. We no longer have a pure delta function for V, but it is a delta function plus kappa into a theta function, step function. <coughs> a pressure, the only change is this multiplier. It changes the amplitude. And if kappa is small, as it usually is the case, then this is not going to be a major change. So friction doesn't have much of an impact on the pressure or sea level. It has an impact on the amplitude of the V field here. This multiplier is there. But the most serious thing is that uh, this term, second term here, is going to imply a non-zero V behind the Rossby wave front. So it's no longer just a delta function. This is the Rossby wave front. This is the other part. And you will not get uh, uh, a non-zero V field behind the front. That's what the solution does. Likewise, the Ekman drift will not be completely cancelled out because you have this exponential term multiplying uh, the um, second theta term, second step function. Now, in writing this t plus x by CR here, I have said CR equals beta by alpha squared. So I basically looked at the magnitude. In today's lecture, you will find T minus X by CR. That's because I've used its uh, uh, sine to. There should be a minus beta C squared by squared. So this was the solution when we had uh, kappa P by C squared included as the friction. There is a non-zero equivalent drift and there is a non-zero V field. So the sweater balance now is Py balancing the wind stress, and there's also a steady U and V field. But this U and V is going to be small, and uh, that's basically because the friction is small. Kappa is usually a small number. And uh, likewise, the impact on the pressure field is small. The next thing we do is to <coughs> include Vt and no V. So what happens to the Rossby wave solution if we retain VT, which means we are no longer assuming full geostrophy, but only a long short geostrophy, because this term still remains. Fv will still be equal to Px. So what happens to the Rossby wave solution if we retain VT and include no V in addition to kappa P by C squared? Inclusion of VT implies that we relax the constraint of full geostrophy and assume a long short geostrophy which is a much less severe constraint. Basically, what we are going to do now by including VT is to allow the Killing wave to exist. The Killing wave had earlier become an instantaneous wave that just uh, shut off, setting up the long short balance. And uh, that was at infinite speed. So in uh, near zero time, that balance set up. But that's not going to be the case now. 
because we're going to retain VT, which means the killing wave will have a finite propagation speed. And the coastal adjustment will therefore take place over a finite time interval. For simplicity, we'll set the parental number nu by kappa to 1. We have seen that we don't really gain much by looking at a parental number different from unity. And there are numerical differences, but it doesn't lead to any remarkably different solution. So there is no purpose in um, this kind of solutions to assume uh, nu not equal to kappa. We'll go ahead with partial number set to unity. <laughs> so the relevant equations now are minus Fe plus Px equals 0, Vt plus Fu plus Py equals tau naught by h into y of y to theta of t minus nu v. So we have added this friction term and we have retained Vt. The only change is in this middle momentum equation, long short momentum equation. Third one is pt by c squared plus ux plus vy equals minus nu by nu, nu p by c squared. So this kappa has been replaced by nu. Is it required to put that minus nu v, which is kind of bottom drag thing, I think? In the v momentum equation. Okay, what's the question? Uh, yeah, is it required to put that minus nu v, which is kind of a bottom drag for the v momentum equation? What do you mean? Is it necessary? Is is it necessary to put it there, or we can actually get a Kelvin wave without that term as well? You will get a Kelvin wave, but we have already included kappa c kappa p by c squared. Yes. So we would just uh, like to add this. You could do it term by term. Okay. There's no reason why you can't do that. Uh, one solution that would definitely be of interest to see is uh, where you just include Vt and ignore friction. Yes. That would be a useful solution to look at because you'll have the finite adjustment time of the Kelvin wave and uh, of course you will have a steady balance once the Kelvin wave and Rossby wave have gone off. So behind the front you will still have a steady sweat uh, balance with zero current. The Ekman drift will be cancelled out and there will be no B field. B will be restricted to the uh, delta function like Rossby wave front. Okay. Okay. So here we go. We um, make a substitution. This is done only to make it easier to write the, I mean, to save space out here as far as algebra is concerned. We want to replace uh, dou by dou t plus nu which is what you get here in both equations here by dou by dou t prime. So whenever you see t prime it simply means that dou by dou t plus nu has been replaced by dou by dou t prime. It uh, saves a lot when you want to cross differentiate and eliminate terms and so on. So we have vt prime plus fu plus py equals the wind stress term and uh, your pt prime by c squared plus ux plus vy equals 0. v is uh, px by f, so vy is px by f minus beta by f squared into px, that's standard. u is uh, tau naught into y of y by h, theta of t prime minus py by f minus px t prime by f squared, where this last term comes because we have replaced vt prime by px t prime by f. And you differentiate that with respect to f, you will, uh, um, sorry, it's vt prime is this, uh, this is u. So ux is minus pxy by f minus pxx t prime by f squared. There is no uh, term coming from the with stress itself because it's x-independent, as has been the case throughout. So we're going to substitute for ux and vy in this third equation and uh, get a single equation in p. We have pt prime by c squared minus beta by f squared in px minus p in y term.
Okay. So we get a single equation in P as usual. This time it is PT prime by C squared minus beta PX by F squared minus uh, PXX T prime by C squared equals zero. Marked out two balances here. If you look at the balance between the first two terms, that is PT prime by C squared minus beta PX by F squared, that's balance A. That's basically loss uh, waves. We looked at non-dispersive waves earlier, but now remember that you have a new sitting out here that modifies things. So you get both dispersive and non-dispersive loss waves. Balance B is between uh, the first and third terms, PT prime by C squared minus PXX T prime by C squared. And this is basically beta plane coastal killing waves. If you recall, PT by C squared minus PXX T by C squared is the kind of equation we got earlier. The T derivative would just drop out, so you would get PXX minus PT. There is a C squared problem somewhere. Sorry, there's a mistake here. There is a mistake here. Can't get that. Yes, it's PXX T prime by F squared. Okay, this. The C squared should be replaced by F squared. So in this equation, giving this balance, the c squared will be replaced by squared, page 12. And that balance is basically the beta plane uh, Kellen. We proceed as we did earlier. Take the Laplace transform. For qt prime, you will get s plus nu into q hat. qt prime can be broken up into qt, which will give you sq. sq hat and uh, you have nu into q that will give you nu into q hat so it's s plus nu into q, q hat and uh, you take laplace transform you get s plus nu by c squared into p hat minus s plus nu by f squared into p x x hat uh, it's been done correctly here minus beta by f squared into p x hat equals zero uh, we look for the highest order term and write that without any coefficients. So the differential equation in x is now p hat xx plus beta by s plus nu into p hat x minus alpha squared p hat equals zero, where alpha as usual is f by c, inverse of the what's called the Rossby radius of uh, deformation. It's the characteristic length scale. If you assume that the solution is of the form e power kx, you don't know what k is like. We just assume a solution of the form e power kx and uh, plug it in and see what happens. Do you get uh, sensible uh, expressions for k? Uh, if you do, then you have a solution. This is a valid form. Because uh, this equation you can show has uh, a solution and the solution is unique. So if you can find a solution, it is the solution. If you plug e power kx into this expression, then uh, you get k squared plus beta by s plus nu into k minus alpha squared equals 0. It's a quadratic in k. Solve the quadratic, you get two roots k1, comma 2 is equal to minus beta by 2 into s plus nu plus minus square root of beta squared by 4 into s plus nu squared plus alpha squared. And uh, therefore, p hat of small p hat of x comma y comma s is equal to capital p hat of y comma s. That's amplitude. And p power k one x plus q hat 
of Y commands into epoch K2 S. Now, K1 is the one with the plus sign here. And all these terms, both these terms under the square root are positive. So if you take the square root, you will get a term that is larger than the negative term here. S is positive, mu is positive, beta is positive. So you will get the square root part larger than the negative term out here. So k1 is greater than 0 and k2 is less than 0. So only e power k1x carries energy offshore or decays offshore because x is less than 0. You cannot have x, uh, I mean, since x is greater than 0, you cannot have a solution with uh, negative uh, uh, k out here. Because x is less than 0. So q hat of y comma s is 0 as uh, has been the case throughout. So p hat of x comma y comma s equals capital P hat of y comma s into e power k1x. Note that k1 is a function of y because of the alpha in the square root term. This has to be kept in mind because uh, we will have to differentiate the expression for capital P um, with respect to uh, y at some time. But uh, if you want to determine uh, u, you will have to differentiate p hat, small p hat, with respect to y. And when you do that, you will not only end up differentiating capital P hat, that's a function of y and s, but also e power k1x, because k1 is a function of y. So that's something we have to keep in mind. It gives us one additional term. We proceed as we have always done. As before, separate the problem into interior and coastal parts. The interior solution q prime hat is, as before, given by v prime hat equals 0, p prime hat equals 0, and u prime hat is torn out by FSH into y of y. This is just going to be the equilibrium. So once again, ahead of the Rossby wave, you have only the equilibrium. That's the interior solution. When you come to the coast, you have to cancel the equilibrium, and that forces a coastal solution, which is obtained by solving the homogeneous equations. The coastal solution Q double prime hat is the solution uh, obtained uh, above. That is what we got here. This one. So P double prime hat is capital P hat into E power K one X. V double prime hat is P double hat uh, P double prime hat X by F. We'll have to determine that. Uh, we can get that easily because uh, all you will get is this P hat, which will remain intact. E power K one X will be differentiated with respect to X, and uh, basically you will get uh, K one into E power K one X, and you divide by F. So V hat is uh, V double prime hat is easy if you get this capital P hat. U double prime hat is minus P double prime hat Y by F minus S plus nu into P double prime hat X by F squared. As before, we apply the boundary condition at X equals 0, determine capital P hat. U hat is U prime hat plus U double prime hat and that has to be 0 at X equals 0. So when you set x to 0, you basically set that exponential term to 1. e power k1 x will go to 1. And uh, the expression you get is sorry, out by HSF into y of y minus p hat y by f, where p now is the capital P, the amplitude, minus s plus nu by f squared into k1 into p hat equals 0. Uh, this derivative comes from the y differentiation, this term comes from the x differentiation and first term is from the interior solution u prime. 
So what do we have? We have capital P hat Y plus S plus nu by half to K1 to P hat equals standard by HS into Y1. <coughs> As we did the last time, we saw using an integrating factor. In this case, it is uh, given by lambda. It's equal to S plus nu integral. The limit here is Y. K1 by F dy prime. An integrating factor is represented by an indefinite integral. That's why this y is just to indicate that this integral is performed in y. y prime is basically a dummy variable. Remember that f is a function of y, and so is k1. We have not faced a situation before where we had a term of this kind. So this is the integrating factor. And uh, this is the equation we have e power minus lambda into open bracket e power lambda in capital P hat close bracket differentiate with respect to y equals standard by hs into y of y. So we can write down capital P hat that's simply equal to e power minus lambda that will come from here when you take it to the right hand side into integral from capital A to y e power lambda that comes from this term into town out by hs into y of y prime dy prime. Note, as lambda tends to 0, the solution tends to the full just the solution. You can check this out. Because what you will get is e power minus lambda and e power lambda by into 1. Town out by hs will be a constant that will come out and we will be left with the integral L of y prime dy prime, which is basically what y of y prime dy prime, which is basically what we had earlier as the integrating factor. Second thing to note is that as always L will go to minus infinity, the lower limit. So capital P hat of y comma s is turned out by hs into e power minus lambda integral from minus infinity to y e power lambda y of y prime dy prime where lambda is s plus nu into integral k1 by f dy prime. So we can write down the expressions for p hat. Now small p hat of x comma y comma s is tau naught by hs into e power k1 x e power minus lambda integral minus infinity to y e power lambda y of y prime dy prime v hat of x comma y comma s equals tau naught by hs into k1 by f. This is what you get when you differentiate with respect to uh, x and there's a division by f e power minus lambda integral minus infinity to y e power lambda y of y prime dy prime this is uh, nothing changes here and u hat of x comma y comma s is tau naught by hsf the y of y minus p double prime hat y by f minus s plus 2 y squared p double prime hat x so this is what we need to do now we need to differentiate with respect to x for p hat, which is easy. It's done here already for v. We also need to differentiate with respect to y. That's going to be a little tricky because uh, you have this integral, you have this e power minus lambda outside, and you have e power k1 x. And k1 is a function of y. So the three terms that you will get when you differentiate. Uh, it's been worked out in some detail here. P double prime hat x is uh, straightforward. You just get this k1 out here. P double prime hat y gives you the first derivative uh, is for the integral. The lower limit is a constant. It will yield you nothing. All you will get is e pi lambda into capital Y of Y. e pi lambda will cancel out this e pi minus lambda and you will be left with tau naught by hs e pi k1 x into Y of Y. That's what you have in the first term. So tau naught by hs into e power k1x has been taken out as a common uh, factor. So you get y of y. 
The second uh, derivative is for e power minus lambda. And uh, if you recall what lambda is, it's s plus nu, that's a constant, integral rho y, k1 y f dy prime. So you'll basically get s plus nu into k1 by f. That's it. S plus nu into k1 by f, and the rest of it remains identical. Nothing changes there. And of course, these terms are there. This factor, which has been taken out as a common factor. We close the bracket here, and now we differentiate e power uh, k1 x. That will simply be giving you x into d by dy of k1. So that has been written as k1 by k. Now add up the terms. When you add up the terms, you get one term coming from the interior solution. That's the first one. The second, third, and fourth terms come from the y differentiation. And the last term comes from the x differentiation. So terms two, uh, sorry, three and five cancel out. So when you differentiate with respect to x, that uh, term cancels out with one of the terms resulting from the y derivative. And you're left with uh, three terms here. This one comes from the interior solution, and the other two come from the y derivative. The first of the terms that is retained from the coastal solution is um, coming from the differentiation of the integral. The second term that is retained comes from the differentiation of k1. So here's the solution. P hat of x comma y comma s is equal to tau naught by hs into e power k1 x into e power minus lambda integral minus infinity to y e power lambda y y prime dy prime. V hat of x comma y comma s, we've seen this before, tau naught by hs into k1 by f e power k1 x e power minus lambda integral minus infinity to y e power lambda y y prime dy prime. And u hat of x comma y comma s is tau naught by hsf into uh, open brace bracket y of y into open square bracket 1 minus e power k1x. And that's coming from those first two terms plus x k1y to e power k1x into e power minus lambda into the integral close brace bracket. So if k1 uh, is uh, 0, this term will go out. And well, k1 can't be 0. What will be 0? One part of it will disappear. The new part will disappear if you ignore the friction. So I've written out k1 also here. k1 is minus beta by 2 into s plus nu to open square bracket 1 plus under the square root sign and following that the square root uh, in the square bracket is closed. So under the square root sign, you have 1 plus, this term has now been taken common. So 1 plus 4 alpha squared or beta squared into s plus nu the whole squared. We're going to evaluate the solution in two limits. This is a tricky one. It's not something you can look at in general terms. So we look at two limits that are of interest. The first one is t tending to 0, which means s tends to infinity. And the other one will be t tending to infinity, that's s tending to 0. So when t goes to 0, that is, the moment you switch on the wind, s goes to infinity. So limit k1 as s goes to infinity is uh, limit s going to infinity of this term. Um, if you rewrite it, you'll get under the square root sign alpha squared. So that will give you just alpha when it's taken out of the square root. To 1 plus beta squared divided by 4 alpha squared and s plus nu the whole squared. Now s goes to infinity and it comes in denominator. So this is a large term in the denominator, which means the term out here is small. Alpha anyway I'm going to take out. So under the square root I have 1 plus a small term. And I use standard expansion, Taylor series. I get alpha into 1 plus half into 
1 by 4 alpha squared into beta squared is plus the whole squared plus the remaining terms. And um, if you work this out and set the limit as tending to infinity, you find that this term drops out and so does the first term in the limit. That leaves you with just alpha. So as s goes to infinity or t goes to 0, k1 just goes to alpha. Which basically implies that as t tends to 0, you have no beta effect. Which makes sense. Because the beta effect is basically triggering the Rossby wave. And the Rossby wave has a much slower adjustment time scale because it is slow. Its speed is beta c squared by x squared which is much less than c. And basically what it means is that when you switch on the wind, the initial adjustment is as if you were on an airplane. It's basically going to be the Kelvin wave shooting uh, poleward along the coast and uh, setting up a balance behind it. But as uh, time t goes to infinity, you will see the Rossby wave effect. The Kelvin wave would have passed through the region of interest, and what you will be left with is the slow moving Rossby wave front. And as t goes to infinity, we will be looking at either a region ahead of the front, which will simply be the equilibrium or behind the front, and that is the solution, we'll just take a quick look at. Uh, so, lambda in the limit as s uh, goes to infinity is given by s plus nu, integral k1 by f dy prime, that's s plus nu, k1 is simply alpha, so you substitute that, and alpha is f by c, so it cancels out this f, and you are left with s plus nu by c into y. Substitute k1 equals alpha and lambda equals s plus nu by c into y into the expressions for p hat, v hat, and u hat. And if you do that, solution simplify to that is f plane solution at t equals 0 plus. I'm going to leave this for you as an exercise. It's, I think, worked out in one of the solutions in Mercedes notes. Take a look at it. Case 2 is what is usually of interest. It's uh, not that case 1 is not of interest, but it's just that uh, with most observational data sets, you will not catch the postal killing wave easily. When you look at typical data sets like the automator, you are not likely to see a killing wave. It's very difficult. It requires very sophisticated techniques to pick the killing wave and automator data. But the Rossby wave moves slowly, and you're going to see that. It's like it's the most uh, striking feature of the Indian Ocean solutions you have these Rossby waves moving slowly across the basin. Case 2 is therefore one of interest. t tends to infinity or s goes to 0. So limit k1 s going to 0 is limit s going to 0 of uh, the term again, same term, but now written a little differently. And when you do that, these two terms cancel out and you're left with k1 as s goes to 0, k1 tends to alpha squared nu by beta. So friction comes into play. Why does friction come into play? Because Rossby wave moves slowly and the friction time scale is 1 by nu. So the Rossby wave is going to feel the effect of that. You don't find that out here. In uh, K1, that was just alpha. When we looked at uh, the initial period, the moment you switch on the wind. Limit s going to 0 of lambda is limit s going to 0 of integral s plus nu by f into substitute for k1 alpha squared nu by beta dy prime. s goes to 0 here. You get alpha squared nu squared by beta f integral with respect to y prime. You can substitute for alpha squared and uh, basically this is what you get. Now if you pick uh, reasonable numbers for f, c, beta and look to see when nu squared f by, under what conditions nu squared f by beta c squared will be much less than 1, which basically means uh, lambda goes to 0. Under what circumstances you can ignore that? Then uh, the condition you get on nu squared is that nu squared is very much less than 10 power minus 4, or nu is much less than 10 power minus 2 centimeters squared per second, which is not bad. And uh, 
Therefore, S tends to 0 implies lambda tends to 0, which implies e power lambda and e power minus lambda both tend to 1. This is going to basically give you the Rossby solution. Therefore, with bt and nu v, and of course kappa p by c squared, the solution is as follows. The first thing that happens is we switch on the wind, the Kelvin wave runs up the coast. It goes forward because we are looking at the eastern boundary and we are looking at the northern hemisphere. Subsequently, the Rossby wave propagates the coastal current option. And this is what it looks like. Ahead of the front, nothing changes because the Rossby wave front hasn't reached there. It's basically the interior solution. It's the same in all cases. It's just the equivalent drift, P equals 0, V equals 0. We have a Rossby wave front out here. We have a sweater balance behind the Rossby wave front with non zero U and V. And this is what happens at uh, finite times when the Killing wave has gone up the coast and the Rossby wave front has moved reasonably offshore. This is the balance that you get. Okay, we've looked at a lot of solutions on the for the coastal case, and I thought it useful to summarize them. So this is basically a summary of switched on coastal solutions, and we'll not be looking at the one forced by offshore winds because that's not of any consequence. Um, welcome, Minakshi. Better late than never. And it's the summary now. Summary of switched on coastal solutions. So the first one we saw was F plane. The three F plane solutions and the three beta plane solutions. So first one is F plane, no UD, no friction, no Y variation in the wind. And when you have that, you have P of X comma T, there's no Y variation in the solution either. C tau naught by H into E power F by C X to T into theta of T. V of x comma t is uh, given by this expression. Again, you have t into theta of t. So you find a constant acceleration, a constantly accelerating solution. U of x comma t is tau naught by fh into 1 minus e pi f pi c into x into theta of t. Uh, so there is the equipment drift in the interior, and as you come close to the coast, it uh, weakens, and at the coast, it vanishes. The length scale over which this um, Ekman drift is affected in the vicinity of the coast is given by C by F. That is called the Rossby radius of deformation. So we looked at the same kind, same uh, system, but now with friction. So we have an F plane, no UT, no Y variation, but with friction. We have no V, we have kappa P by C squared, and we set nu equals kappa. When we did that, we got P of x comma t equals C tau naught by nu h. So there's a nu coming here. The amplitude has been modified a bit into e power f by c, that's as before, into 1 minus e power minus nu t into theta of t. So as t goes to infinity, 
this e power minus nu t goes to 0. So you'll be left with uh, just 1 from this expression. And you have theta of t. We have something similar coming for v. Tau naught by nu h into e pi f by c into 1 minus e power minus nu t into theta of t. And if you actually take the limit nu going to 0, you will find that uh, when you expand e power minus nu t in the Taylor series, the 1 will cancel out the 1 here. You will be left with nu t. The nu will cancel this out. And you will get the accelerating solution as you did before. So by including friction, u is not affected, but p and v are affected. The acceleration now stops. And the e folding time scale over which the acceleration stops is capital T equals 1 by nu. So when you bring friction into play, it stops that acceleration. And we saw some cases uh, when nu is not equal to kappa. We looked at the limit uh, t going to 0, t equals 0 plus, and basically that solution gave us a constantly accelerating solution. Then we looked at the limit t going to infinity and we got the steady response. So, uh, because t going to infinity is uh, this time dropping out and you will get basically the, uh, <coughs> how you call it, uh, sweater balance. The third solution was again f plane, no ut. So we are assuming a long short geostrophy throughout, no friction, but now with y variation. So it's a modification of the first uh, one, but uh, now the modification is not that we add friction, but that we add y variation. So basically, we're looking at what's called a wind patch. In the literature, you will very often find people talking of a wind patch. It means that the wind forcing has a finite extent. In this case, the finite extent is in the middle direction, which is the long short one. The solution we got, uh, now we had a capital P as an amplitude. Capital P of y comma t was tau naught by h into open square bracket integral minus infinity to y, y of y prime dy prime, where y of y was the wind patch uh, form in the long short direction. So this term minus integral minus infinity to y, y of y prime minus ct dy prime. Again, integral from minus infinity to y. This y prime minus ct basically tells you there's a thing. This is a typical form for a wind. P of x comma y comma t is simply capital P of y comma t into e power f by c into x. And V of x comma y comma t is capital P of y comma t into 1 by c into e power f by c into x. So coastal calendars. Uh, coastal Kelvin wave propagates with coast on its right because we are looking in the northern hemisphere, f greater than zero, leaving behind a steady balance in which wind stress is balanced by the pressure gradient. This is possible now. This was not possible earlier. This is possible now because you allow the Kelvin wave to take away the energy along the coast and leaving behind the steady state solution. So, this constant acceleration that we got can be killed by putting in friction or by allowing a Kelvin wave to take that energy away. There are two ways in which this, we could do it. Then we moved on to more complicated solutions. We relaxed the F-plane assumption. We said we're looking at a beta plane now. We're looking at what's called a mid-latitude beta plane. So F is F0 plus beta 1. And uh, wherever it's not differentiated, we will just uh, set f to a constant. Wherever it's necessary, we will keep f as a function of y. That's basically what the mid-latitude beta plane means. And we have done that in deriving those equations, basically. So if we have a beta plane, no ut, and now no vt. So we assume what's called full geostrophy and no friction. So you have a geostrophic balance along the coast and in the cross shore direction as well because fp is going to be given the balance by px and fu by p1 or minus p1. So solution now is p of x comma y comma t is tau naught by h into integral minus infinity to y, y of y prime dy prime. You don't have that uh, y prime minus ct anymore into theta of t minus x by cr. And this is what I meant. I have written uh, minus x by cr instead of plus x by cr because CR is now minus beta C squared by squared. When I wrote this, I wasn't uh, aware of what I had done the last time. Uh, but either way, it's the same thing. 
as long as you take care or you put the appropriate sign for CR. CR is uh, beta C squared wave squared, the Raspberry wave speed. And um, V of x comma y comma t is torn out by HFCR into integral minus infinity to y, y of y prime dy prime into delta of t minus x by CR. U of x comma y comma t is torn out by HF into y of y into the difference between two step functions. The first is theta of t and the second is theta of t minus x by CR. So ahead of a delta function like Rossby wave front, there is Ekman drift. So where the Rossby wave has not reached, you have the Ekman drift. That is called the interior solution. The wind stress is balanced by the pressure gradient behind this front. There is no current behind it. There is a steady balance in which pressure gradient balances the wind stress. Solution 5 was one in which we still had a beta plane and full geostrophy, no UT, no VT, but now we had friction but only kappa p by c squared, small change. The solution changes not by much as you would expect because kappa is never going to be large. If friction is dominant in your solution, there is usually some problem. It's not something that should be important away from a boundary. Um, without that friction, you cannot get momentum into the ocean. So friction is important. Friction is also important to bring the current to rest at a boundary, the long shore current. But if friction is dominant in an interior solution or away from a coastal region or away from the surface, you actually have a problem. There's some problem in your physics or maths. So as you would expect, the change is not much. You get an e power kappa alpha squared by beta into x term multiplying. And since kappa is small, if you expand this in a Taylor series, you get 1 plus uh, kappa alpha squared by beta into x and so on. So it's uh, basically 1 plus a small perturbation on that. And the rest of the P field does not change. V is similar, but with one uh, small change. You had only a delta function earlier, but now you have that delta function plus kappa into a theta function. Now kappa is small. So you do have a V field behind the Rossby wave. It's no longer a zero current. You have an E power kappa alpha squared by beta into x multiplying the second uh, step function in the expression for u. Uh, so the u field also doesn't get cancelled out. The Ekman drift is not cancelled out completely. Because as the Rossby wave propagates westward, it damps a bit. And since it damps a bit, it leaves behind a small v field and a small u field. Because the Ekman drift cannot be cancelled completely. So there's Ekman drift ahead of the delta function like Rossby wave front. There's non-zero u from a v behind the front, but this current is weak. The last solution is what we looked at today. Beta plane, no UT, but retained VT. This is the long short geostrophy. This is the most interesting of the cases. Because this is something we are interested in. What happens when you have a Kelvin wave propagating poleward along an eastern ocean boundary? West coast of India or the eastern boundary of the Bay of Bengal? We include friction too. Nu V and kappa P by C squared, but we set nu equals kappa. We looked at the solution in two limits. T equals 0 plus, so you just switch on the wind. Kelvin wave runs up the coast because of VT. It's like an F plane. The beta effect is something that works more slowly because the beta effect introduces the Rossby wave, which propagates westward and does so at a slow speed. So the immediate response that you get is the Kelvin wave shooting up the coast. Forward. As T goes to infinity, the Ekman drift has, sorry, the Kelvin wave has gone off. What you are left with is Ekman drift ahead of the Rossby wave front, as always, that's the interior solution. And the Rossby wave propagates the coastal current offshore. It will leave behind a residual current because you now have friction. So you will get a non-zero u comma v behind the front. In all these cases, the ocean is trying to reach a state of square root balance. I put it in inverted quotes throughout now. <laughs> the specific nature of this balance depends on the details of the solution. The reason for putting it in uh, inverted quotes uh, is basically to distinguish it from the classical sweat root balance. We are not talking of uh, sweat root equations. The ocean is always trying to reach the sweat root state of sweat root balance. What exactly is the nature of the sweat root balance? Whether it's the wind stress balancing the pressure gradient and no current, or some current wind stress balancing pressure gradient apart from that, is a matter of detail. It depends on the nature of the solution. Do you have a Kelvin wave? 
Do you not have the Kelvin wave? It's a matter of uh, details. But the ocean is basically trying to reach a stratospheric balance. So if you take T2 into infinity, that is the steady limit of the Laplace transform, that is what you get, the spheroidal balance. If you don't have a beta plane, the pressure gradient just balances the wind stress. If you have a wide variation in the wind, if you don't have that, you get the equilibrium cancelled at the coast and you get a weak, weak current because of that. You have to conserve mass. In all the coastal problems, the solution consists of an interior response, that's a particular solution, P prime hat and V prime hat were zero throughout for the interior solutions. And the coastal response, that's the general solution to the homogeneous equations. There are two boundary conditions. The solution must be bounded as one moves offshore and the cross shore current at the boundary must be zero. You can't have flow into the coast. In all cases, the first boundary condition, which in this case we looked at eastern boundaries, so x going to minus infinity, is used to eliminate one of the two possible solutions. When the OD is of second order, you will get uh, two terms. And you get two undetermined constants or functions of uh, the other variables. We were looking at uh, p hat or y comma s in many cases. And uh, the first boundary condition that's x going to minus infinity was used to eliminate q hat in all these cases. I mean, q hat was the one specifically chosen to be eliminated. The second boundary condition is used to determine the amplitude of the coastal solution. That is basically that capital P hat. The forcing for which is the interior solution. So the interior solution is the solution to particular uh, uh, is a particular solution for the non-homogeneous equation. That is, and the coastal solution is the solution to the interior to the homogeneous equations. What forces the coastal solution is that you have to cancel the interior solution. That's the equilibrium drift at the boundary. And the need to do that ensures that uh, you get a coastal response. We found all these solutions for a switched on wind stress field, theta of t. The solution was found using Laplace transforms. This method gives the transient response. You get uh, a function of time in the solution. <coughs> so you can look at any time t that is of interest to you. You can look at what happens at the instant you switch on the wind. We saw some particular cases of that. You can see what happens as t goes to infinity. That's the steady response. So this method gives the transient response with the t tending to infinity steady state being determined as a limit. This limit essentially yields a spherical balance. And again, the details depend on the details of the uh, physics. What have you retained and what have you dropped? But the ocean is always trying to reach a state of spherical balance. And everything it is doing, variating these waves, is basically in order to do that. In the interior, we looked at Ekman pumping, that was the state of spherical balance. So you had to radiate either gravity waves or you had to radiate Rossby waves in order to reach that state. In this case, you could radiate Kelvin waves because you had a coast and reach a state of spherical balance. But that is what the ocean is trying to do as t goes to infinity. Of course, uh, the more interesting thing that we look at now is uh, because you normally never have switched on winds. You don't switch the wind on and that. It, it remains stationary after that. The wind usually varies with time. And one variation that is of interest, apart from the switched on wind, is what happens when you have a purely periodic forcing. So suppose you have not a theta of t kind of uh, wind forcing, but a e per i sigma t kind of wind forcing. What happens to the response? Now note that you can look at the switched on wind, a step function, as a summation of a uh, Fourier series. But if you have a step function, you have such a sharp change, you need a very large number of terms, essentially infinite terms, an infinity of terms, with non trivial amplitudes in order to generate that step function. You need very low frequency waves, you need very high frequency waves. But if you have a oscillating wind, you're going to be looking at a particular period. And one major change that occurs is that you will get something called a critical latitude. And that comes because if you remember the square root that we had for k1, k2 was gone because the solution had to be bounded. So k2 went out. For k1, we said that uh, 
in, under the square root there was a plus sign separating the two terms under the square root and both terms are positive so there's no way the square root can go negative which means you're not going to get an imaginary part of the solution but when you have an oscillating wind the sign inside the square root will become negative and when that is negative there is a chance and it happens it will basically depend on the latitude it will be a function of y there will be a latitude poleward of which that term will become imaginary and when it becomes imaginary you will cease to get a wave the propagating wave if you have e par i sigma t plus e par i k1 kx where k is uh, real you have a propagating wave but if your k has an imaginary part kr plus i k i then that i k i multiplied by uh, i x will give you a minus k i into x e power minus k i into x k i that i is subscript and that will mean you have a decaying point so there will be a latitude poleward of which you will not get first views that never happens in a switch on wind because you have all frequencies embedded in so you get rossby waves throughout the domain the moment you look at an oscillating wind you will get a critical latitude and the higher your frequency the more equator wide your critical latitude will shift so if you are looking at internal rossby waves you will get them practically throughout the world oceans if you are looking at the seasonal cycle you will get it throughout the tropics up to about 25 to 30 degrees north it depends on the stratification because beta c squared is squared that's uh, there if you are looking however at the semi annual harmonic in the arabian sea the northern part maybe the last 5 uh, degrees in the north may not have the semi annual cycle if you are looking at inter seasonal periods there are parts of the bay of bengal and the arabian sea the northern parts you will not see a rossby wave and that is of interest because it means that there will be a difference between the way the ocean responds to an inter seasonal forcing these are being the seasonal forcing for a seasonal cycle you will get the rossby wave throughout the basin and that's why you see of uh, the west coast of india the classic radiation when you see that monsoon current in the bay of bengal it's the rossby wave front and it's just like this that's the rossby wave front that we've been seeing it's not in this so here this is the rossby wave front so we saw the monsoon current initially is basically going flat out into the bay of bengal but then as uh, time goes on it bends like this and it bends like this because this rossby wave just moves west and it starts pushing the um the monsoon current farther and farther west and uh, by the time the summer monsoon ends and you hit october and november the strand is washed against the coast of sri lanka and uh, summer monsoon current disappears and the winter monsoon current sets in the bay of bengal and then that moves incessantly westward after some time even that will disintegrate because it will hit the coast it will reflect the reflection properties that will be of interest but then uh, if you ignore what's happening because of that the winter monsoon current is gone and you will be left with the summer monsoon current that starts a new cycle because the wind is oscillating ubiquitous in this basin the most striking feature of the seasonal cycle of the basin is rossby waves and that's why these solutions are of interest so in the next class we will take a look at what happens when you have oscillating winds and then we'll take a look at uh, the animations for the coastal solutions uh, i hope to do it tomorrow i hope i don't have to cancel tomorrow's class we'll meet at 4 o'clock fine 4 o'clock tomorrow tomorrow is a holiday in inquis for what Uh, this is a new year in uh, oh ugadi ugadi it's holiday here too but is in rh yeah. uh, okay we'll meet on thursday tomorrow is thursday okay we'll meet on friday
So Minakshi, it's not New Year for you, but Happy New Year to all of you anyway. And Happy oh, Gudi Padwa to those who celebrate it here. Okay, so see you on Friday at... Friday I won't be there. What happened to you on Friday? Uh, 4 o'clock I won't be able to attend the class. I've got a class. Uh, tough. <laughs> hey, you are older so teachers leave us kids alone. <laughs> and uh, you are tech savvy so you can look at YouTube. We'll uh, meet on Friday because uh, majority wins and in coins will swamp you any day. I see at least two faces there. I don't know if there are any more left. Maybe killed by friction over time. <laughs> Only two drifters survive. Okay then. So Friday, four o'clock. <laughs>